The year is 1976. An Iranian F-4 Phantom fighter jet engages an unidentified flying object. The UFO is projecting multicolored strobe lights when suddenly it releases an object that shoots toward the Iranian pilots. The pilot gets a lock on the object, but before it can be destroyed, the plane's weapons and communication systems go down. The pilot takes immediate evasive actions. Fast forward to the 2000s, Iranian F-14 Tomcats engage another UFO. This time there are casualties. The UFO evades the fighter jets and flies out of the atmosphere at Mach 10. It would seem that Iran and UFOs have an interesting history together. When you hear stories of unidentified flying objects, you may imagine a flying saucer or little green aliens. Not only that, but the person who's giving the account seems to always be someone who's not quite all there. They tend to have their crazy hair and wild eyes, but the UFO UFO accounts from Iran are detailed and provided by respected military personnel. The information comes from the eyewitness accounts and classified documents that have been leaked to the public. The first contact between a UFO and the Iranian military occurred in 1976 above the city of Tehran. It was a cool desert night. There were no clouds in the sky. The Milky Way stretched across the heavens like an oasis in a black desert. The sound of shopkeepers closing up their stalls for the night filled the air. Then, suddenly, the skies over Tehran lit up. It was just after midnight on September 19th. Tehran residents began telephoning the local airport, frantically relaying the same message. They were seeing bright lights in the sky. The lights seemed to hover in place and then move rapidly to a different location. It was as if the lights were looking for something. Or someone. The military and airport personnel checked the radar, but nothing showed up. General Yousefi, the man in charge of the airfield, stepped outside and looked up at the sky. Sure enough, he saw the bright lights for himself. He witnessed the lights jetting across the sky. They looked like shooting stars being controlled by some unseen entity. He scrambled back into the airport and found his best pilots to investigate further. General Yousefi ordered Lieutenant Yadi Nazari and a backseat weapons officer to take off and have a look at the object in the sky. It was time to get up close and personal. The F-4 Phantom fighter plane took off at 1.30 a.m and leveled off at the altitude of the unidentified object. Upon approach, the F-4 lost all navigational instruments and communications. The dials and screens in the aircraft went haywire. Nazari was flying only using his instincts and what he could see. He kept his eyes on the UFO and his aircraft pointed at the horizon. Nazari made the decision it was too dangerous to continue this way and was forced to turn around and return to base. As soon as the plane began moving away from the UFO, the instruments came back online. It was as if the UFO had some sort of electronics jammer. A second F-4 Phantom was launched at 1.40 a.m., piloted by Lt. Parvez Jafari. He approached the UFO and acquired a radar lock. This meant that there was definitely something tangible in the sky. The UFO was a solid mass that reflected the radar and therefore couldn't have been ball lightning or any form of pure energy. Upon getting closer to the UFO, Jafari reported that its lights were alternating in color from blue, green, red, and orange. They were strobing so quickly that they almost appeared to be solid. The UFO began to move south and Jafari pursued the vessel. All of a sudden, the UFO stopped in mid-air. It just sat there, unmoving, as if the law of gravity was a force that it could choose to obey or not. Jafari veered around and stopped the aircraft so he wouldn't collide with it. He turned his jet back around and headed back toward the unidentified vessel at a slower speed. On the return approach by Jafari, something even stranger happened. The UFO dropped a bright object out from its main hull. Jafari reported that the object was headed straight for him and his F-4 Phantom, and it looked like a torpedo made of light. He attempted to lock onto the incoming projectile with his AIM-9 Sidewander infrared guided missiles, but just after getting a lock, he lost all communications with his weapons console. Jafari was forced to take evasive actions and turn away from the projectile. He jammed the flight stick to the side. The F-4 did a barrel roll and avoided the incoming object. Jafari leveled off again and when he turned back to look for the object shot at him, Jafari said he saw the device reverse course and rejoin the main UFO. It then seemed to dock with the mothership. Jafari then witnessed another bright object coming out of the main UFO and descending straight down toward the ground. It left a bright trail of light as it descended. The ambient light lit up an area of around 3 kilometers. Then, as if it were done with its business it came to Iran to conduct. The UFO accelerated and shot out of the atmosphere. Jafari watched as the strobing lights faded into the night sky. As the F-4 Phantom prepared to land, 
it experienced more communication and navigational failures. Upon further investigation, a commercial airliner in the area also reported communication failures at the same time as Jafari, but the airliner did not see the UFO. Ground troops were sent to recover the fallen object, but as they approached the area, their equipment started to malfunction. No trace of whatever the UFO shot toward the ground was ever found, as far as we know. Approximately three decades went by without any reports from Iran about UFOs in their airspace. Then, in 2004, strange aircraft were once again encountered by the Iranian Air Force. At this time, Iran was still using a few F-14 Tomcats that they'd purchased from America before the revolution. The Iranian military used the Tomcats to protect their nuclear facilities. Considered one of the most successful fighter jets ever built, its speed, maneuverability, and weapon capabilities make it an aircraft to be feared and respected. The encounter in 2004 went something like this. An alarm was raised when the unidentified flying object was picked up on radar. The UFO entered the airspace above one of Iran's nuclear facilities. Fighter pilots ran to their jets. Mechanics shouted at one another as they prepared planes for takeoff. The pilots were secured in the cockpits by the support crew and the hatch was sealed. The only contact with the outside world was through their helmet. Pure oxygen was being pumped into the face mask to keep them alert. Over their comms, head military personnel were barking orders. An attack on our nuclear facilities could be incoming. We need planes in the air now, the commander shouted. The Iranian pilots flickered the afterburner switch on the engine controls. The F-14 Tomcats accelerated off the runway and into the black sky as flames shot out of the back of their jet engines. As they reached Mach 2, the sonic booms could be heard throughout the desert below. The Iranian military launched eight F-14s, eight F-4 Phantoms, and two large reconnaissance aircraft to intercept the UFO. The task force encountered objects that they'd claimed had astonishing flight characteristics. One of the F-14 Tomcats tried to lock on to the brightly shining objects, only to have his radar disrupted. The pilot who was tracking the object described it as being spherical and having a green afterburn. It was recorded that whatever engines were producing the green aura were leaving considerable amounts of turbulence behind them. It was like flying through a lightning storm. The plane shook and convulsed uncontrollably. The task force swung out of the turbulent wake of the UFO and tried to flank it from the sides. Before they could get into position, the spherical object shot off like a comet, leaving a tail of green light behind as it exited the atmosphere. The eerie glow was ingrained into the minds of the pilots who were in the task force that day. The Iranian Air Force remained on high alert for any further UFO activity after the 2004 event. Then, in 2012, another strange phenomena occurred. A UFO was spotted in Iranian airspace. It did not show up on radar at first, but then all of a sudden a blip appeared. It was like the ship was cloaked and had just appeared out of thin air. The military scrambled to the F-14s and pursued the vessel, but then tragedy struck. As one of the F-14s took off, it exploded in mid-air. The aircraft was consumed in a fireball. The smoldering metal fell from the sky and landed in the sands below. Some accounts claim that the UFO attacked the F-14 right after it took off perhaps using laser beams or a highly advanced weapon that ignited the fuel in the plane's tanks. Both of the crewmen in the plane were killed instantly. Reports by the Iranian government seem to suggest that the UFO had something to do with the mishap, but it's unclear the role the unidentified aircraft played in the catastrophe. Other F-14s flew after the unidentified object. Every time they tried to get a lock on the UFO, their armament systems would malfunction. The dull green light of their screens would appear to be working perfectly one moment, and as soon as a lock was achieved, everything went black. The pilots would try rebooting the systems mid-flight, but nothing seemed to work. The UFO quickly outpaced the F-14 Tomcats as it reached Mach 10, a speed faster than any aircraft currently produced can fly. It was almost like the UFO was toying with the F-14s. With the afterburners, the Tomcats pursued their enemy at a top speed of just over Mach 2. This is 1,534 miles per hour. The encounter ended similarly to the one in 2004. The UFO shot out of the atmosphere with a glowing tail of exhaust behind it. Each of the unexplained encounters recorded incredible capabilities of the UFOs. In all three cases, radar was jammed and weapon systems malfunctioned when the UFO was present. It seems that once the UFO left the general area, the instruments started to work properly again. You have to wonder what whoever was controlling the UFO was after. Their radar jamming capabilities seem highly sophisticated, yet 
they still allowed the Iranian military to know that they were there. Was it an accident all three times, or was the UFO testing Iran's Air Force capabilities? Another common factor between the encounters was that the UFOs all left the atmosphere after encountering the Iranian aircraft. They seemed to launch away at Mach 10, which is 10 times the speed of sound, or 7,612 miles per hour. The closest any known human aircraft has gotten to that speed was Mach 9.68. This was achieved by a NASA experimental hypersonic aircraft called the X-43. And why did they shoot out the atmosphere instead of just leaving Iranian airspace? Was there some other vessel waiting for them in orbit around the Earth? Was there a large mothership waiting to launch to light speed once the reconnaissance ships returned? All of the accounts also mention the UFO hovering, which means that they could remain in the air with a velocity of zero. The massive acceleration it would take to go from zero to Mach 10 in seconds is not possible with our current technology. All of the UFOs were also described as luminous objects. They emitted some kind of light, whether it was the strobes from 76 or the green afterburn glow of the 2000s. Could the lights be some sort of undiscovered propulsion from an advanced alien race? Or is there a country on Earth that's discovered an advanced propulsion system that the public is unaware of? There are several theories as to what the UFOs might have been. Iran has claimed that they were secret United States spy planes. They've also suggested that the aircraft were state-of-the-art drones that the US military was using to spy on Iran. However, the United States does not have the technology or capability for achieving Mach 10. It also seems unlikely that a spy aircraft would emit bright lights that would give its position away. Could the UFOs that Iran encountered be extraterrestrial? Is there any evidence to support that aliens have a special interest in Iranian nuclear sites? At this point in time, all we know is that on three separate occasions, skilled Iranian Air Force pilots encountered unidentified flying objects with advanced technological capabilities. There seems to be no definitive explanation for the UFOs encountered by Iranian military personnel. Whether the United States has advanced secret technology or Iran has encountered extraterrestrial UFOs, the three events still remain a mystery to this day. We have confirmed that a number of these unidentified objects are indeed solid. So said the leader of the Pentagon's newest investigation into UFOs, which you probably know as UAPs today. The long culture of ridicule is officially over, UFOs are real, they are here, and nobody has a clue who's building them. But while UFOs were part of American culture for nearly a century now, the world would be shocked at the disturbing similarities between events happening in the US and a world away behind the impenetrable Iron Curtain. The secrecy is over, and what has come from declassified sources both within the former Soviet government and the CIA itself is nothing short of terrifying. Soviet sightings of UFOs run as long as sightings in America, but most Soviet citizens had no clue what was going on in their own backyards. Thanks to a strict culture of secrecy and censorship, it wasn't until Glasnost started to open Soviet society up that the lid on the Soviet UFO secret finally came unscrewed. Some news outlets purposefully dramatized relatively ordinary events as they exercised newly found freedoms and pushed just to see how far they could take things. However, there were plenty of very real UFO-related events happening, and some were high-profile enough to catch the attention of CIA spies behind the Iron Curtain. On January 29, 1986, at 7.55 p.m., a quote, amazing event occurred on Hill 611 near the village of Dalnegorsk in Primorsky Kray. This small mining town is of no note, but that night it would become the most important place in the entire Soviet Union. That evening, multiple villagers observed a reddish sphere flying into the town from the southeast. The object flew while making no noise and appeared to be a nearly perfect sphere of rust red. It got close enough for people to observe that the outer skin of this strange craft was without blemish and had no obvious control surfaces nor means of propulsion. For a while, the object hovered up and down over the village, moving at a relatively slow pace. As it ascended, it would glow brighter before dimming as it descended. Suddenly, the object appeared to be in distress. All witnesses interviewed later by Soviet authorities recalled just how the object jerked or jumped suddenly, then fell like a rock straight down onto Hill 611. Witnesses heard a dull thump as it impacted and then began to burn intensely for an hour. Valery Voshilny, head of the Far Eastern Committee for Anomalous Phenomena, arrived at the site two days after the crash. He noticed that despite everything being covered in deep snow, the site of the crash was completely devoid of it, allowing him to observe splintered silica rocks which could only have occurred from extreme temperatures. The rocks were also smoky looking as if they'd been exposed to intense heat. However, Vulzhilny also found physical evidence of the craft. 
All over the site, embedded in the rocks themselves, he discovered silvery pieces of metal. Some were fragments, but a large amount had formed into droplets, almost as if they'd been sprayed over the area. This detail would become significant after the fall of the Iron Curtain, when Western UFOologists would compare notes with their Eastern counterparts. American witnesses had very often reported seeing flying orbs, which seemed to spray metal while showing signs of some kind of distress. At the edge of the crash site was a tree stump that had been severely burned and emitted a strange chemical smell. The physical remains were examined at the Omsk branch of the Academy of Sciences, who made a shocking discovery. Some of the fragments had formed into what appeared to be small nets, and when these were put under examination, it was discovered that they were made up of torn and very thin threads, 17 micrometers in width. Each thread consisted of even thinner fibers tied up in plates, and intertwined with the fibers were thin, solid gold wires. The technology to replicate this type of delicate nano construction wouldn't appear on the Earth for decades, at least not in human hands anyway. The fragments, which had formed into iron balls, were also put under a battery of tests. Each ball consisted of iron with various levels of aluminum, manganese, nickel, chromium, tungsten, and cobalt. This seemed to rule out a natural creation and the object just being a very peculiar meteorite. Rather, it mostly confirmed that the object was built from heterogeneous alloys. When the balls were melted in a vacuum chamber, they reacted in various ways. On one base, they would melt and spread out as expected, but on another, they formed into smaller balls with convex glass-like structures. But melting the remains revealed yet another mystery. Gold, silver, and nickel would disappear from the balls and be replaced with molybdenum, despite not being present in the sanitized test chamber before testing commenced. The metallic remains would confuse Soviet scientists as they only produced more questions than answers. About the only thing they were able to identify was ashes discovered on the site belonging to a biological being. Perhaps the ashes belonged to an unfortunate animal caught under the crash, or perhaps they belonged to the operator of the mysterious UFO. Sadly, the intense heat made any attempt at identification impossible. Unable to tease out details from the remains, the investigation turned to the object itself before it crashed. The trajectory as reported by eyewitnesses happens to coincide with the flight path taken by rockets launched by China's Xishang Cosmodrome. However, investigators weren't able to verify if any launches had taken place in January from the complex, and the Chinese were not forthcoming with any answers, likely looking to keep their space program as secret as possible. However, the investigation revealed something very startling. Soviet citizens had not been the first to spot this mysterious object, the Chinese had already observed it over their own territory. Just days prior to the crash, witnesses close to the Xishang Cosmodrome reported a similar red sphere on January 25th. According to witnesses, the object appeared to simply hover, almost as if observing the Cosmodrome directly. After half an hour, it disappeared. The Chinese sighting wasn't the only clue that this object had traveled great distances, though. There was physical evidence, too. Examination of the soil at the crash site revealed small pieces of light gray-colored soil, but only in the area where the object was presumed to have made direct contact before exploding and mostly disintegrating. Put under spectroscopic analysis, the light gray soil was matched with soil from another area in Russia thousands of miles away. The soil matched tufts from the area of Yaroslava, northeast of Moscow, containing characteristic elements found there and not in the Dalnogorsk area. Whatever had crashed there, it was obvious somebody came looking for it, though. Eight days after the crash on Hill 611 at 8.30 p.m. on February 8, 1986, eyewitnesses once more reported strange objects in the sky. This time, two yellowish spheres flew into the town from the north. The spheres seemed to be looking for something and made their way directly to the crash site. Once there, they circled the crash site four times, then turned to the north and flew back the way they came. Was it a search and rescue effort by whatever had sent the original sphere there, or simply something wanting to make sure no identifiable remains had been left behind? To this day, nobody knows, but reports of flying spheres exactly mirror similar reports from all the way across the ocean in the United States. And the following year, whoever had visited the sleeping mining town returned in force. November 28, 1987, 1124 p.m. Reports of flying spheres flood a local military base. Terrified villagers report seeing as many as 32 flying objects, which spread out over 12 different nearby villages. Alarmed Soviet military personnel quickly make their way to the nearest villages and observe the strange flying lights for themselves. Before the night was over, 
Hundreds of civilians and military personnel would bear witness to one of the largest mass UFO sightings in history. The objects appeared specifically interested in Dalnigorsk, and 13 of them broke away and flew directly to the mining village. Once there, three of them hovered stationary over the village, while five seemed to illuminate the nearby mountain and crash site. They appeared to move with no discernible propulsion and made no noise, hovering at varying altitudes between 150 and 800 meters. As the lights flew over homes, people reported disturbances of their electrical equipment. Ministry of Internal Affairs officers would later testify that they observed multiple objects at 11.30 p.m. One object flew toward them from the direction of the Gorley settlement, leaving a, quote, fiery flame behind it. At the head of the flame was an opaque sphere, and within that sphere was another smaller red sphere. At a local quarry, eyewitnesses observed a large cylindrical object the size of a five-story building flying directly toward them. The object was around 200 or 300 meters, with the front lit up like burning metal. Terrified that the object was going to crash into them, many of them fled for shelter. The quarry manager observed the object moving at an altitude of about 300 meters, large and cigar-shaped. The description would also precisely fit that given by American and Western European witnesses of very similar objects. The object appeared to fly without the aid of wings and no discernible propulsion, making no noise as it flew over the quarry. Nearby, a kindergarten teacher observed a dark, metallic-looking, elongated object she estimated at 10 to 12 meters long. The object appeared to be in front of a bright, blinding sphere of light that hovered noiselessly at the height of a nine-story building. The object hovered over a school and shot a half-meter-wide violet bluish ray down at the ground in front of the school. The teacher remarked that the objects caught in the ray did not create shadows as would be expected if they were being illuminated from above. The object then departed the school and moved to a nearby mountain. According to her, the object appeared to be searching for something, emitting a reddish projector-like light onto the mountain. Finally, the object simply departed by flying over the mountain and out of sight. The crash and subsequent UFO invasion of Dalnegorsk would remain secret for years, but once it made its way into the West, the similarities between this event and multiple similar events in the US would convince researchers that Americans and Soviets were both observing the same mysterious phenomenon. Cigar-shaped objects and mysterious balls of light are a commonly reported type of UFO in the US for decades, and multiple eyewitnesses have reported what they thought were malfunctioning air or spacecraft of some kind which bobbed up and down, as reported by the Dalnigorsk witnesses, while emitting a shower of what appeared to be molten metal. Curiously, some of the craft described by the Dalnigorsk witnesses bear a strong resemblance to the infamous US Navy Tic Tac video, filmed by fighter pilots intercepting an unidentified aircraft over the Pacific Ocean. But this isn't the only parallels between Soviet and American UFO sightings, because while America had Roswell, the Soviets also had their own close encounter with alien beings, and their encounter had more and better witnesses than Roswell. It is not a joke, nor a hoax, nor a sign of mental instability, nor an attempt to drum up local tourism by drawing the curious, so said the Soviet state press agency TASS, discussing a UFO close encounter in 1989. According to the official report, two boys and a girl from a local school were playing in a park on the evening of September 27th. At approximately 6.30, the children observed something pink shining in the sky, followed by a ball of deep red colors they estimated at 9 meters in diameter. A small crowd gathered as the ball seemed to land, and a hatch opened in the lower part of the ball. From within the ball, three aliens with three eyes each exited, standing nearly 3 meters tall. The aliens seemed to have a robot companion with them, which they activated with a touch. As the crowd watched in awe, the aliens seemed to communicate with each other, ignoring the onlookers, until a young boy screamed in terror. Suddenly, one of the aliens locked his three eyes on the child and caused him to become temporarily paralyzed. The three aliens then re-entered their vehicle, but quickly re-emerged, with one carrying what the crowd thought was a gun of some kind. The alien aimed the tube at a 16-year-old boy who suddenly vanished, only to reappear after the aliens re-entered their craft to depart. The story was met with both ridicule and a serious investigation, as is typical of UFO reports. To this day, accounts vary. A Soviet evening news correspondent dispatched to the town with a film crew failed to find any eyewitnesses to the aliens except for the children. However, they did speak with the local police chief, who confirmed one important detail of the account. He too had seen a large, silently flying craft shortly before the alleged landing took place. 
Soil analysis discovered high concentrations of radioactive isotopes in the landing area, but this proved inconclusive as after the Chernobyl disaster it was not uncommon to discover small pockets of highly concentrated radioactive isotopes. However, what's curious is that if it was a hoax, the children just happened to pick a landing spot with said high concentrations of isotopes, which would require analysis in a lab to even identify. Even more curious, when the children were separated into different rooms by investigators, they all drew nearly the exact same craft from memory. The craft was also said to leave behind a mysterious X-shaped sign in the sky as it took off, exactly mirroring UFO encounters reported in the United States by the defunct American magazine Saga in 1976. Given the strict censorship of the Soviet Union in the 70s, it is nigh an impossibility the children or police chief would have had access to said magazine. But why were there no other eyewitnesses to the alien beings themselves? One only need to look at the culture of ridicule surrounding UFOs to understand why a bunch of adults in the repressive communist Soviet Union would not want to speak up about such an extraordinarily weird event. As highlighted in the United States' own recent UAP investigation, a culture of ridicule has, quote, hampered our efforts to collect good data, as pilots are self-censoring for the fear of ridicule and it affecting their future careers. The US Air Force and Navy took that recommendation so seriously that they immediately instituted new guidelines for reporting UFOs, ending the infamous century-long culture of ridicule that silenced witnesses even amongst America's most elite military units. Soviet pilots, however, were long reporting UFOs and on occasion even being killed by them. While on a routine flight over the city of Borisov, two Soviet fighters spotted a large flying disc near the city. The disc seemed to have five beams of light emanating from it. Two were directed upwards into the sky, and three were pointed down at the ground. Ground control instructed the patrol to fly in for a closer look, an act that would doom one of the pilots. On approach, the disc suddenly flew up to match the speed and level with the lead Soviet fighter. Suddenly, it aimed one of its beams directly at the plane, filling the cockpit with blinding light. The co-pilot was at the controls, and the flight logs recorded him reporting a bright ray of light entering the cockpit and projecting a spot about 20 centimeters in diameter. This ray of light swept across the cockpit and directly through the pilot's body, with both pilot and co-pilot reporting extreme heat. The plane broke off and returned to base immediately. Shortly afterwards, the co-pilot's health immediately deteriorated with frequent fainting spells that forced him into retirement. The aircraft commander, however, died within a few months of the incident, with the cause of death listed as cancer. This wouldn't be the only report of a UFO shooting beams of light, though. A declassified CIA report notes an encounter with hundreds of eyewitnesses, including a Major V. Loganov, outside the city of Omsk. In his own official report, the Major states that he and other eyewitnesses spotted a strange object in the sky which radar could not pick up. The object passed overhead at an altitude of several kilometers, revealing a shining sphere one and a half times as large as the current full moon. The object was casting four very bright beams of light, sometimes parallel to the ground and sometimes at an angle. The UFO hovered over a civilian airport for five minutes and even descended a bit. Suddenly, the beams of light disappeared and a whirling plume trail appeared around the shining sphere. With an extraordinary burst of speed, the object took off to the east. Pilots from a nearby second airport reported seeing the object but being unable to pick it up on their radars. Immediately relaying the sighting up the chain of command, within five minutes other military personnel at Alte Cray reported having the same object under visual observation. Given the time and distance, the object appeared to have traveled 600 kilometers at a speed of about 7,000 kilometers an hour. UFO sightings were so frequent in the Soviet Union that the declassified CIA report also notes a meeting of 100 Soviet scientists from various disciplines, all meeting together to discuss the dramatic uptick in UFO sightings in the 1970s and the 1980s. It's now known that some UFO reports inside the Soviet Union were highly secretive US air and spacecraft. Other sightings were misattributed to everything from secret rocket launches to failed rockets or simply spent rocket stages. However, just like multiple American UFO investigations would reveal, that still left a significant number, about 5% of sightings that simply could not be explained. And most disturbing of all were reports from Soviet nuclear facilities of unidentified craft that perfectly mirror similar reports from the United States in the same time period. In one high-profile encounter, a UFO nearly started World War III. 
Colonel Boris Solikov spoke with Western UFO investigators after the fall of the Soviet Union, reporting that on the night of October 4, 1982, there was a breach of airspace over a nuclear weapons site in Usovoyen, Ukraine. Solikov, who was working at the Kremlin at the time, described receiving alarmed reports from the facility whose operators had informed him their launch panels all had suddenly activated on their own, something which should have been impossible. For four hours, the entire facility watched a hovering UFO as it loitered directly overhead. While it hovered, the control panels, which could launch the nuclear weapons stored there, suddenly came to life, something which could have only happened with the input of the proper launch codes. The incident sparked a 10-year investigation by the Soviets into the UFO phenomenon, which they kept under wraps until the end of the Cold War. This event closely mirrors a similar incident at a U.S. nuclear facility in Minot Air Force Base, when security personnel observed a UFO which hovered over the silos holding America's nuclear-tipped Minutemen missiles. According to witnesses, the missiles briefly became active and went into launch state, despite having received no such authorization or command from their control centers. Perhaps unsurprisingly, UFO reports around Soviet nuclear facilities remain very difficult to verify, but the Soviet Union had a plethora of otherworldly sightings which only grew in number as the Cold War dragged on. At 4.05 a.m. on September 20, 1977, a group of dock workers in Petrozavoytsk witnessed a blinding light on the horizon from the direction of Lake Onega. The light approached the slumbering city before shifting into the shape of a glimmering jellyfish whom according to eyewitnesses began to hover over the city and shoot thin beams of light down into the city. The dock workers were terrified, concerned that their nation was under attack. This being the height of the Cold War, paranoia over a nuclear conflict between the Soviet Union and the US was running high. After 12 minutes of shooting beams of light down into the city, the UFO transformed once more into a bright semicircle and shot back off in the direction it came. Suddenly, it veered upwards and punched through the clouds, leaving a burning red hole where it passed that quickly dissipated. Later that morning, more witnesses would come forward, and the list would grow from the initial dock workers to police officers, sailors, and an ambulance crew, and a reporter for the state news agency. Under pressure to prevent an all-out alarm, the reporter would post a story three days later calling the phenomenon strange and natural. The object left no physical evidence behind save for a photograph allegedly taken of the object by one of the witnesses. However, given the veil of secrecy in the Soviet Union at the time, the photograph has been impossible to verify. However, neighboring local governments became so alarmed by the incident that they demanded an answer from the Kremlin leadership. When they were unable to provide a satisfactory response, the event was taken to the Academy of Sciences, where the Soviet Union's most prolific scientific minds worked. They couldn't come up with an explanation for the sighting, but after doing some research, concluded that the UFO phenomenon was very real and required more dedicated investigation. The Academy's secret investigation started a year later and ran all the way until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Unofficially known as the Network, this government-backed investigation ran for 13 years and had one goal – scientifically understand the UFO phenomenon. The network enjoyed the support of 20 different organizations staffed by specialists in physics, chemistry, optics, and spectroscopy. The initial investigation was kept top secret for two reasons – either it would verify the existence of extraterrestrial life, or the findings could have some form of defense value. The network also had to coordinate its investigation with the defense ministry, a task which created some conflict. Where scientists working for the network found a mystery needing scientific investigation, the defense ministry simply saw a threat or potential enemy, thus the two sides had vastly differing approaches to their UFO investigations. Even so, the two sides worked together to gather UFO data. The network gathered reports from scientific institutes and Soviet citizens, while the defense ministry gathered them from within the Soviet military, perhaps spurred on by repeated violations of their air and space by very advanced American aircraft, first the U-2 and then the Blackbird spy aircraft, Soviet soldiers were under strict orders to report all mysterious phenomenon, especially if it interfered with their equipment. This was stark in contrast to the US, where a culture of ridicule had sprung up in both the military and civilian sectors, despite multiple ongoing secret investigations by the Department of Defense. The network would go on to investigate 3,000 UFO reports, debunking all but 300 of them which they had no explanation for. The results would mirror both the US Air Force's Project Blue Book effort and the latest investigation into UAPs by the Department of Defense, 
but this debunking work was critical for the understanding of what was a real UFO and what wasn't, even when the Soviet Union's secrecy made such work difficult. The Petrozavoitsk event, for instance, would be solved by an American engineer working for NASA who put together the pieces missed by the Soviets. Using NASA's satellite tracking center, he discovered that the Soviets had launched an object from their top-secret cosmodrome in nearby Plisetsk at 3.58 a.m. just minutes before the sighting. However, that doesn't explain the motion witnessed and attested to by many observers. Rockets can only go up, even if they do so at a very diagonal angle. They certainly can't hover and they can't lose or gain altitude at will. Could the UFO then been a response to the top secret launch minutes before, or was it a case of bad eyewitnesses being very mistaken about what they saw? We may never know the truth, but what we can be sure of is that something was recreating the same exact UFO phenomenon over the Soviet Union that was taking place over American skies. After half a year of anticipation and a slew of very high-profile incidents involving military ships and aircraft, the Pentagon has finally released a congressionally mandated report on unidentified flying objects. And what's inside the report has sent shockwaves around the world. Keep watching as we unpack the entire recently released UFO report page by page. Shortly after World War II, UFO sightings began to explode across the world. World War II pilots themselves had reported UFOs as well nicknaming them Foo Fighters. But UFOs went mainstream after several high-profile incidents in the late 1940s and 50s. The first was Kenneth Arnold's UFO sighting, where he spotted multiple flying disks in formation, moving several hundred miles an hour faster than his aircraft was capable of. Then, there was the alleged Roswell crash, which, while has been thoroughly debunked by now, still served to spark the public's imagination. Then came the UFO invasion of Washington, D.C., with multiple bright objects spotted hovering over the nation's capital. The U.S. military was immediately tasked with getting to the bottom of the UFO phenomenon, leading to the creation of several investigative bodies that culminated with Project Blue Book. An official and all-encompassing investigation into the UFO phenomenon, Project Blue Book was canceled in 1969 after analyzing over 12,000 UFO reports. Its final conclusion was stark. No UFO the project investigated ever posed a threat to national security. No UFO investigated ever exhibited technology beyond the scope of what was at the time modern scientific knowledge, and there was no evidence that any sighting that remained unidentified was in fact extraterrestrial in origin. Yet Project Blue Book did generate just over 700 incidents that the investigative body could not explain. Some of those incidents were truly hair-raising and included numerous highly credible witnesses, such as the encounter of a UFO over a CIA-funded uranium mine in Africa, reported by a former World War II fighter pilot who was deemed extremely competent by the CIA agents sent to debrief him, or the numerous reports of hovering UFOs over American nuclear weapons storage depots and missile fields, with positive contact on local radar and multiple on-the-ground eyewitnesses amongst the security and maintenance personnel. Perhaps even more chillingly, shortly after the Cold War ended and the Iron Curtain around Eastern Europe fell, came the discovery that extremely similar incidents had been occurring in Soviet missile fields and nuclear facilities as well. Officially, the government stopped investigating UFOs. Unofficially, small internal investigations took place throughout the years as the UFO phenomenon continued to be reported by both civilians and military personnel, though those investigations were more concerned with discovering advanced Russian or Chinese technology and not aliens. Then, in the early 2010s, Nevada Senator Harry Reid secured funding for an unidentified aerial phenomenon program tasked with investigating UFO reports. This would lead to the leaking of several pieces of very high-profile video as U.S. fighter jets encountered strange flying objects off the east and west coasts. Then came a shocking discovery earlier this year. While it was believed that the UAP program had been terminated, the U.S. military had recently restarted an unacknowledged investigation into phenomenon. Early in 2021, the U.S. Congress mandated that the Pentagon had six months to prepare a report on its findings on the UAP phenomenon and that it should be as unclassified as possible so it would be readily available to the American people. A separate classified copy of the report does exist, but that's only because this copy of the report deals with the technical details of America's most advanced weapon and sensor systems. So, what does the Pentagon's UFO report say? First, this is only a preliminary report, as the Department of Defense Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force continues to operate and investigate the UAP phenomenon. The report begins with an acknowledgement as such, and states that the Pentagon's future goals is to enhance training of U.S. military personnel, 
so that they can better report encounters with UAPs and thus help American intelligence services assess a potential threat. This likely means that after decades of discouraging soldiers, airmen, sailors, and marines from reporting strange things in the sky, a much more open culture of sharing UAP incidents will be created to facilitate the job of the UAP task force. Interestingly, the report also acknowledges that there will be a concerted effort to develop new technologies for the documenting of UAPs. Before moving on, the report states that overwhelmingly sensors which have captured UAP analyzed by the task force were assumed to be operating correctly, though there is an acknowledgement that some UAP incidents could be attributed to malfunctioning sensors. Next, in the executive summary, the report makes very clear declarations that the UAP task force simply lacked enough high-quality reporting to draw a firm conclusion on the nature or intent of UAPs. Due to a culture that discouraged service members from reporting UAPs as well as a lack of high-tech sensor assets, the task Task Force had to limit their investigation to reports between 2004 and 2021, and acknowledges that a new system of reporting UAP needs to be established to better assist investigators in their task of discovering the nature and intent of UAPs. Shockingly, though, the report then makes the following conclusion. Most of the UAP reported probably do represent physical objects given that a majority of UAP were registered across multiple sensors to include radar, infrared, electro-optical, weapon seekers, and visual observation. What this means is that a significant portion of UAPs investigated by the task force were deemed to be real physical objects verified by their observation across several different mediums of detection simultaneously. So much for glowing swamp gas. The report moves on to acknowledge what UFO eyewitnesses have been stating for years, that in a small number of incidents investigated, the UAP exhibited very unusual flight characteristics. One recent U.S. Navy encounter, for instance, documented on radar, showed several UAPs plummeting from 50,000 feet to sea level in seconds before shooting back up to even greater heights. According to the UAP task force, UAPs could likely be resolved to one of five categories. Airborne clutter, natural atmospheric phenomenon, U.S. government and U.S. industry developmental programs, foreign adversary systems, and the catch-all, other. The task force is of course mostly interested in the final two categories, foreign adversary systems and other, as both could pose a significant threat to the United States of America. The report goes on to state that UAPs without a doubt pose a safety risk to both military and civilian flight, and a challenge to U.S. national security. If UAPs are alien in origin, then that would be an obvious threat to not just the US but global security. However, the task force is most concerned with the possibility that UAPs are evidence that a potential adversary has developed a breakthrough or disruptive technology which the United States does not understand and cannot counter. Given how the US has used both breakthrough and disruptive technologies in war to devastating effect against its adversaries, the fear of such a technology being employed against the US is understandably great. The report moves past the executive summary and into the details of the six-month investigation. Right off the bat, the UAP task force tackles the greatest challenge that it faced in completing its investigation, namely, that reports were hardly ever formally filed by UAP witnesses. This is due to a variety of reasons, such as the lack of a formal reporting procedure for UAP phenomena, which changed with the Navy adopting said procedures in 2019 and the Air Force in 2020. In the future, the UAP task force is hopeful that improved reporting procedures will lead to better quality reports. However, the task force's greatest difficulty in collecting good data was something that UFO eyewitnesses have known for decades. Eyewitnesses of unidentified aerial phenomenon hardly if ever spoke up about their experience for fear of ridicule or ostracization. The task force's report, though, states that as senior military, government, and scientific leadership begins to engage in the topic publicly, the stigma of reporting strange encounters should lessen, leading to better data collected. Another difficulty the task force encountered was that despite having very sophisticated sensors, sensor systems in the US military are typically designed to fulfill a very specific role, and that often means they are not very useful for identifying UAPs. This is likely why the report began with the acknowledgement that new technologies needed to be developed for the specific purpose of investigating UAPs. The report moves on to state that the reports investigated had too little data to allow for detailed trend or pattern analysis. However, there was a noticeable consistency in the size, shape, and propulsion of UAPs. This is a stunning conclusion, as if UAPs were merely the figments of one's imagination or random natural phenomenon, there would not be a strong consistency in the way UAPs look, how big they are, and how fast they move. The report goes on to state that UAP sightings also tend to be cluttered around US military training and testing grounds. This goes hand-in-hand -hand with a theory long held 
that whatever they are, UAPs are very interested in the state of our military technology, or it could be an indicator that these are very much foreign adversary systems being used to spy on US forces. However, the task force acknowledges that this cluttering of UAP sightings around US military training and testing grounds could simply be due to collection bias, as those areas have a high concentration of sophisticated sensors and an expectation and guidance by personnel involved to report any anomaly. Now, the report drops another bombshell. Out of the hundreds of incidents investigated thus far, the task force identified 18 incidents where UAPs were witnessed performing aerial maneuvers that would signify advanced technology was in use. These UAPs were recorded hovering in place, moving against the wind, performing extremely abrupt changes in speed or direction, and displaying extremely high velocities without any known means of propulsion. In a small number of these incidents, U.S. aircraft also detected radio frequency energy emanating from the objects. Some of the UAPs observed also displayed some degree of signature management or purposeful manipulation of their own electromagnetic emissions. In modern military, signature management is a critical era of war fighting, with friendly forces doing their best to screen their electromagnetic signatures from adversaries while making them identifiable to allies. This would imply that UAPs are employing the same form of electromagnetic security measures that modern earthbound militaries do. The task force states that more rigorous examination of the collected data by experts is necessary to ascertain if this is in fact what UAPs have been recorded doing or not, and ends this section by stating that the UAPTF will continue further analysis to determine if these incidents are proof of breakthrough technologies. From here, the report once more states that more data is required to determine the identity of UAP incidents investigated, with special attention needed on those incidents where UAPs are shown to display flight characteristics which would be indicative of breakthrough technologies or signature management, which would be indicative of intelligent control over an artificial object. In their investigation, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force was not able to attribute any of these incidents investigated to classified U.S. weapons programs. The report moves on to declare that UAPs pose a definitive threat to flight operations and could be a potential national security risk. In 11 instances, pilots reported near misses with UAPs. Touching on the potential for UAPs posing a national security threat, the report states that the task force has initiated an effort to identify any potential technological breakthroughs by potential adversaries, namely China and Russia. This likely means that significant U.S. intelligence resources are also being redirected to the effort, as now the intelligence community joins the hunt to explain UAPs. Given the proximity of UAP to U.S. military facilities and to aircraft carrying the military's most advanced sensor systems, the report seems to indicate that a high priority should be placed on discovering if a potential adversary has in fact developed and fielded a disruptive or breakthrough technology. Because if they have, it's clear the U.S. military is all but powerless to counter it. Finally, the report ends with a call for more resources and better reporting procedures across the American government and military of UAPs. So, does the US military believe that alien UFOs are cruising the skies above our heads? Simply put, no. But the report does acknowledge that a significant number of credible UFO incidents investigated by the UAP task force display instances of technology that would be beyond the scope of what's currently possible. The UAPTF's greatest concern, however, remains that it's not aliens but a potential adversary, which is flying close to our most sensitive military installations, and we're all but helpless to stop it. March 4th, 2019. A pair of F-18s are out on a training mission over the Atlantic Ocean, just a few hundred miles off the northeast coast of the United States. The men are on high alert, not just because of their training mission, but because, since at least as far back as 2014, pilots have been reporting strange phenomena over the airspace simply known as W-72, located just off the coasts of southern Virginia and North Carolina. Today, one of the F-18s will not only encounter this phenomenon, but document it. Flying at several thousand feet, the F-18 weapon system officer spots three objects he believes are drones. Flying in for a closer look, he's startled to discover that these objects are like nothing he's ever seen before. At 2.44 p.m. Eastern Time, the F-18's Wizzo takes out his smartphone and snaps a photo of a spherical object flying close to his aircraft. At 3.02, the plane runs across a second mysterious object, this time dubbed the Acorn. Then, 12 minutes after contact with the second UFO, the F-18 comes across yet a third object, this time nicknamed the Blimp. The photos are submitted to the newly formed Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force and remain classified until two of them are leaked to the public. The photo of the sphere, however, remains classified until it was too leaked to the public only recently. Perhaps most shocking of all, though, is that after decades of silence on the UFO matter, 
The Department of Defense is quick to admit that the photographs are real, though of what exactly, nobody knows. But that's far from the only UFO bombshell the Department of Defense would drop while you were busy worrying about the coronavirus. That same year, 2019, four months later, this time it's the Pacific Coast. Destroyers USS Kidd, USS Rafael Peralta, and USS John Finn are out on exercises 100 miles off the LA coast. In order to prevent being snooped on by curious civilians and foreign intelligence services, the destroyers are operating under strict radio silence. Suddenly at 10 p.m., a lookout on the USS Kidd spots what he identifies as two drones approaching the ship. Ten minutes later, both the USS Rafael Peralta and the USS John Finn report their own sightings. As the ships continue on their course, the drones seem drawn to the Kidd and even match its speed and bearing. One drone moves in close enough to hover over the helicopter pad briefly, then returns to formation. After 90 minutes, the drones speed off, and despite some of the best sensor technology on the planet packed into three ships, none of the ships are able to determine where the drones departed to. The next night, the drones would return. The drones once more follow the warships, and out of desperation, one of the destroyers radios a nearby Carnival cruise liner and asks for visual confirmation of the drones. The cruise liner confirms they too can see four or five drones following the big destroyers around and attests that the drones are not being flown by any of their passengers. Not that it was even a remotely realistic possibility anyway, as the drones linger for three hours, well past the flight time of any civilian or military drone of similar size. Once more, the drones disappear, unable to be tracked to wherever their destination lay. As if that wasn't enough, on the 25th and 30th of July, more drones fly around the Navy destroyers, and that's only the incidents that a recent Freedom of Information Act request discovered. There could have easily been dozens more incidents. However, at least one of these incidents was documented on camera, and the footage was not just released to the public but confirmed as authentic by the Pentagon. The date? Classified. The location? Classified. Personnel involved? Classified. Phenomenon captured? Classified. All we do know about this latest leaked video is that it was shot on the USS Russell using night vision equipment and submitted to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Congressional Task Force, where it was subsequently leaked to the public just this year. The video has clearly been edited and is extremely short, but what was leaked to the public includes several glowing orbs over the USS Russell, followed by a pyramid-shaped UFO that seems to flash with lights as it silently glides overhead. What it was remains unknown and the rest of the footage showing what happened before and after the clip shown also remains classified. What is clear is that American naval ships and aircraft are being very closely observed by someone or something, and leaked photos from the USS Omaha appear to show that these crafts are not like any known aircraft today. The date and location also remains unknown, the government keeping its secrets very close to its chest. In fact, the only details known about the Omaha incident is that a UFO was observed near the ship and after an unknown amount of time descended into the ocean. The ship immediately started a search for wreckage but found nothing, leading investigators to believe that the craft seen in the footage was a transmedium craft, or a craft capable of operating in the medium of the sky and ocean on the same mission, perhaps even space. But what exactly it was remains completely unknown. What is interesting, however, is that recently patents filed by the US Navy included a patent for exactly such a transmedium craft of their own. Dubbed the UFO patents, the technology included seemed so preposterous to the U.S. Patent Office's science advisors that the patents were initially denied, until the U.S. Navy stepped in and flexed its muscles to insist they be granted. Department of Defense insiders remain silent on UFO phenomenon that's clearly increasing in activity over the last few years. What's clear is that whatever these craft are, they're far outside the realm of civilian aircraft meaning that these are either high-tech spy drones used to spy on American ships and planes, or they might be, after all, otherworldly. As we move towards a public hearing on the U.S. Senate on the UFO phenomenon from the Department of Defense this summer, all we can do is speculate. Disclaimer: All of the stories featured in this episode of The Infographic Show come from actual military service members or other government officials, many of them vetted by independent researchers and local or national media outlets. It was late on a chilly February morning, 2007, at approximately 0230 hours, a security patrol stationed inside the nuclear weapon storage area of Nellis Air Force Base, otherwise known as Area 2, called into Central Security Control, a sighting of what appeared to be vehicle headlights far outside the outer perimeter fence a mile or two in the distance. This wasn't uncommon as Area 2 was detached from Nellis Air Force Base, and everything from hikers to off-road enthusiasts would inadvertently stumble upon the little-known facility in the desert. 
Following standard procedure, the two outer security patrols, Oscars 1 and 2, were dispatched to assume overwatch positions on the reported headlights. Their job, as it often was in these dark desert nights, was to simply observe and, if the civilian vehicle approached too close to the facility perimeter, intercept it and have them turn around. As the two outer security patrols arrived atop the tall bluffs overlooking the reported sighting area, they spotted and confirmed what appeared to be two vehicle headlights approaching down the side of a nearby mountain. Inside of the nuclear weapons storage area, two additional patrols had moved close to the section of the fence the vehicle headlights were approaching, along with the site security supervisor, Security 1. A grand total of 11 Air Force security personnel were watching when suddenly the lights disappeared. Fearing that the oncoming off-road vehicle had turned off its headlights so as not to be tracked, Oscar 1 left its position on the bluffs and moved to an intercept position along the incoming vehicle's estimated avenue of approach. The site's security controller requested the assistance of a main base K-9 unit which had happened to be in the area, and the two patrols linked up, leaving their vehicles behind moved out to the desert to set up an LPOP, or Listening Post Observation Post. The desert, though, was quiet. Despite the incoming vehicle having been within two miles of the fence line, there was no sound of a revving engine across the still dark desert. Scans with both thermal imagers and night vision goggles revealed nothing. And then suddenly, the radio came to life. Patrols on the interior of the nuclear weapons depot began calling in lights on either side of the dismounted Oscar 1 and K-9 patrol. From their vantage point atop the tall, igloo-style weapon bunkers, they could see a series of lights appear in the 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 3 o'clock of the dismounted patrolmen. Incredibly though, the three men and one dog on the ground could see nor hear anything. Then the site security supervisor came on the radio. Oscar 1, be advised, the lights are moving on you. The three mysterious lights, seen only by interior patrols, suddenly rushed the dismounted patrolman. The senior patrol leader ordered his partner and the K-9 patrolman to lock and load. With lights approaching their position on the desert floor at high speed, he was taking no chances. As far as he was concerned, the mysterious and now aggressive behavior of the lights indicated hostile intent. What happened next depends on which side of the fence line you happen to have been on. For the three patrolmen and one dog on the outside of the fence line, nothing happened. The three men held their breath, M4s at the ready, and nervously scanned the desert with thermals and night vision but spotted nothing. They even checked with the dog, who was trained to indicate if it sensed danger and yet nothing. After a few minutes, the patrol leader called back in over the radio to ask for an update on the lights but received nothing but static. Trying a second and then third radio, the exterior patrols got no reply and slowly walked back to their vehicles to attempt to make contact with the interior patrols again. On the inside of the fence, though, at least two dozen security forces patrolmen, including the master sergeant security supervisor, had seen the lights converge on the location of the dismounted patrol and then simply disappear. Even more incredibly though, when the exterior patrolmen finally made contact with the interior patrols, they were told they'd been out of contact for 20 minutes. Yet each man involved in the incident on the outside of the fence line swore that only 3 or 4 minutes had passed for them. Where had the other 15 minutes of time, all spent without radio contact, gone? Things would only get weirder, though, before they got any better. This incident would prove to be only the opening act to some of the strangest events ever reported by U.S. military personnel. And we can tell you about it in first person because, at the infographic show, we got a chance to sit down with one of the security forces patrolmen involved in these incidents. After the exterior light show incident, things started to get weird. I mean, there had always been weird things out in Area 2. We had everything from ghost stories to weird animal sightings. I'd probably think it was all BS or just tricks the dark plays on you, except a lot of this stuff was seen by numerous people at the same time, or with the help of pretty advanced night vision and thermal imaging devices. What started happening after the lights incident, though, took the cherry in weird and outright dangerous. Within a week of the incident, one of the daytime exterior patrols ran across the corpse of a donkey, which wasn't that weird since there was no civilization around us and animals sometimes wandered out there. What was weird, though, was that this donkey had no head. It was cleanly cut off and there was some crusted blood around the neck, but there was no blood anywhere around the body on the ground. We ended up shrugging it off, figuring that somebody had butchered the animal just dumped it in the desert, completely unaware of how close they got to our facility in doing so. But then, just a few days later, another donkey corpse was found, and this one was missing its head and all four of its legs. Again, no vehicle tracks, no blood on the ground, just a decapitated, legless donkey. The very next day after that, a third donkey was discovered by an exterior patrol, this time at night. This donkey was all also missing its head and legs, but it had its stomach cut open with one clean incision, and the entire contents of the body cavity were gone. 
Once more, there was no blood on the desert floor and no vehicle tracks. We forgot about the donkeys after a while and even though people kept reporting strange lights, nothing too dramatic happened until about six months later. What happened next took the cake. It was almost a full-blown national nuclear security incident. We used to practice assaulting our own storage facilities just in case bad guys got in and tried to steal a nuke or just barricaded themselves so they could set off a nuke in place and irradiate large swaths of Nevada. One of those nights we underwent our usual exercise scenario involving a response by multiple patrols and an assault into our designated training structure. All in all, somewhere around 17 to 18 people were involved. Most of the patrols were at the assault training structure, but we kept the patrol armed with an M249 machine gun on Overwatch just to keep an eye on the desert behind us. Now, Area 2, the nuclear weapon storage depot, was huge, several square miles, so there was lots of empty desert inside the fence perimeter. As we were lining up to assault the training structure, we suddenly got a call over the radio from our Overwatch patrol located on a hill about a quarter mile from us. The patrol said, hey, you got two figures lying prone in the desert behind you. We assumed this was part of the training exercise, so our on-scene commander redeployed a small element to secure our rear as the rest of the response force prepared to assault. However, our flight leader or security supervisor immediately came running up to us and told us to lock and load. He then called over the radio and told central security control to terminate the exercise. Then he turned to look at us and said, I didn't put anyone out in the desert. Whoever's out there is not us. Now, our security supervisor was in charge of running the exercises and he would task random people with playing the bad guys. So when he told us that he hadn't put anyone out there, our blood ran cold. This was about as high a security area as you can get in the US military, home to dozens of nuclear weapons. Anyone who had somehow penetrated our security was not here to have a friendly chat. We immediately returned our magazines to our weapons and charged them, switching safeties off. Our Overwatch patrol had good eyes on the figures. One of the guys on that patrol was using a sensitive thermal camera, and the other was using night vision. That's the standard procedure for us since it gives you two vision modes to ID a target. According to them, the figures seemed to be laying on their bellies, watching us from about 100 meters behind, hiding behind a small berm. The desert out there was pitch black, so we got into a long line and formed a sweeping element. Two heavy gunners on Humvees watched our backs and got ready to light up anything that turned hostile as we started our sweep in the desert. As we approached, our Overwatch patrol warned us that the figures were crawling into new positions. They were actually reacting to our movements and trying to remain hidden. According to the two guys who could see them over night vision and the thermal unit, the figures appeared frantic as if panicking at having been discovered observing us, yet they never stood up and stayed low on the ground on their bellies. For us, on the sweeping element, we couldn't see a thing, despite also using our own night vision goggles. However, the desert was thick with brush, so staying unseen would have been pretty easy for anyone laying low. We kept on moving forward, weapons at the ready, as our Overwatch patrol stayed in constant contact with us, letting us know what the figures were doing. Then, as we got within 25 meters, they just vanished. According to the Overwatch patrol, the two figures were there one moment and then completely disappeared the next. No flash of light, no sound, nothing, just disappeared. We rushed forward to the last known location and swept the area, finding nothing, although one of our guys had brought his handheld thermal imager and was actually able to pick up traces of warmth on the desert floor. Somebody or something had in fact been laying on that floor, long enough to heat it up, watching us as we practice our assault techniques. That incident might have been bone chilling to hear about, definitely to have lived through, but it was far from the only incident involving possible UFOs or even aliens and nuclear weapons. Throughout the Cold War, the United States and even the Soviet Union had several extremely high profile incidents involving nuclear weapons and UFOs, and these incidents have been reported by individuals with extremely high levels of credibility. In 1977, unidentified flying objects not only proved that they could intrude on US airspace unimpeded, but that they might even have have full control over our nuclear weapons. As told by United States Air Force Technical Sergeant Thomas E. Johnson, who was a flight security supervisor at the time, one night a security alert team was dispatched in response to strange lights low in the sky. At the time, Johnson was stationed at a North Dakota missile field, home to dozens of Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missiles housed in underground silos, ready to fire on the Soviet Union at a moment's notice. As the team neared the reported area, they spotted lights in the sky ahead of them, varying in color. The lights would zoom from one location to another at impossible speeds, or other times would simply blink out in one location and blink in at another location. The security team leader said that he couldn't tell if they were multiple objects or just one incredibly fast object. 
Prior to the incident, the security personnel had been briefed by Air Force Office of Special Investigation Agents that unknown helicopters had been reported at other Strategic Air Command bases. The Office of Special Investigation, or OSI, is like the Air Force's FBI, and the special briefings indicated that something very peculiar was going on at other U.S. Air Force bases. Yet that night, the object, or objects, didn't move like helicopters and made no sound. What they did do, though, was far more terrifying. Directly under the lights, the missile launch officers responsible for launching the Minutemen in case of war reported that they lost control over some of the 10 missiles they were in charge of. One of the launch officers later said that they couldn't communicate with the missiles, and if they had needed the launch, they would have been unable to. Incredibly, though, this type of incident would be repeated numerous times throughout the Cold War, and sometimes the actual targeting codes programmed into each missile would be altered or completely erased. Each of these occurrences always happened in conjunction with sightings of UFOs. Are UFOs monitoring our nuclear weapon sites? Is it a coincidence that every major nuclear weapon or production facility in the United States has a long history of UFO sightings? For a growing number of people, the UFO interest in our nuclear weapons is very real, and the case was only strengthened when after the fall of the Soviet Union, former Soviet military and government officials revealed that their nuclear sites had also been host to UFO incidents. Are we being visited by aliens? Check out our video, Were These Historic Monuments Actually Secret Alien Invasions? Or perhaps you'd rather watch something a little less out of this world? Then click this video instead. Either way, click one now before the Zeti Reticulans eat all of our brains.